Shalom, shalom. Greetings to one and all. In the mighty name of Yahushua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. I am Apostle Joel P. W. Reed at your service. I want to meet, greet everyone and on this Easter Sunday. Um, it's a very significant time of the year for many people who believe in the truth of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua Mashiach, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. And I say the world because, obviously, around 2,000 years ago when Jesus, Yeshua, was here, English was not a language. It was not in existence. It was either Hebrew, Greek, and Latin that was spoken at the time. In fact, over the head of our Savior, when he was hanging on the cross, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Not Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This is Yahushua, not Jesus, Yahushua of Nazareth, king of the Judeans, not the Jews, Judeans. Because we're talking about a geographical location. We're talking about a specific people in a certain region, in Northeast Africa, which is now since 1947 called the Middle East. And we now have all of the narrative today compiled in a book that we now call the Bible. And of course, there are other books of the Bible that are missing. Fourteen uh, very significant ones, which is called the Apocrypha, that we find more information on. But the Lord preserved. 66 books that we can look into for the salvation of our souls and even though certain books were taken out the 66 books gives us enough information for us to know the truth and to embrace it in its entirety the whole truth and nothing but the truth praise the Lord now Seeing as it's called Easter Sunday, we're going to go into some facts concerning this particular day. Um, it was in the month Nisan. It was around the time of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, because all of these feasts pertain to the death burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Yeshua Jesus Christ and we want to look into that according to the leading of the Spirit now I'm going to read some scriptures we're going to look in particular at Matthew chapter 27 and St. Luke chapter 24 this is I, now, I didn't do an upload for Good Friday because, quite frankly, Jesus did not die on a Friday. I want to make this clear. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus was quoted as saying, and I'm going to read it to you point blank, verbatim, for as Jonas which is Greek for Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right. And we're going to see in Matthew chapter 27 where when Jesus was crucified, the chief priest went to Pilate to ask a particular petition. I'm not going to jump the gun. We're going to go into the scriptures. We're going to see this. They knew what Jesus meant. We're talking 72 hours buried. So if you're talking 72 hours, you can't have Friday to Sunday morning as the time period for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That is only one and a half days. So to get 72 hours, which is three days, 
you have to go to the middle of the week, which is Wednesday. All right? Now, if you go back into the book of Exodus, chapter 12, you're going to see something very interesting. The Lord told Moses, this is the last plague. After this plague, Pharaoh will surely let the people go. And with great substance, because that was prophesied a few hundred years prior to Abraham, the father of the nations. And so, Moses instructed the Israelites, I want you to take a lamb, or if you don't have a lamb, a goat. And on the tenth day, watch this carefully, on the tenth day, the evening of the tenth day, which means we're gonna we're gonna count seventy two hours here. Watch this. You take a lamb, you bring it into the house, you treat that lamb as if it's one of your own children, okay? Like it was part of the family. On the fourteenth day, the evening of the fourteenth day. So you're talking all of the tenth day, all um, the end of the tenth day. So the evening of the 10th day, which would be going into the 11th day. So it does not include the 10th day. This is very important for us to catch. I'm giving you some Hebrew teaching here. So at the end of the 10th day, bringing the lamb into the house. And all the 11th day, all the 12th day, all the 13th day, that lamb is part of the household. Going into the 14th day, you will take that lamb and you will kill it. So we're talking 72 hours that lamb was in the house of the Hebrews, the ancestors, our ancestors. For three days, three nights, 72 hours. So on the evening of the 14th day, you will take that lamb and you will kill it. You will roast that lamb. No water is supposed to touch that lamb roast it by fire you will eat it hurriedly with unleavened bread and 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 some uh herbs bitter herbs and and hyssop and all other sorts of things that moses gets into detail with then you will take that lamb's blood and you will dab the lintel and the doorposts of the entrance of your house and when you've done that you must get in and you must shut the door because the Lord is going to send the death angel throughout all the land of Egypt. And for the firstborn male, not the females, the firstborn males from Pharaoh's house to the dog on the street. And male only. I want you, this has to be very clear. The male only, not female. Because if you do recall, Remember when Moses was born, they killed all male children, two years old and under. So the, now you see that no sin goes unpunished. What you sow, you reap. So the Lord told Moses to tell him, this is what's going to happen. You want to save your males, the firstborn males? You do this, what I'm telling you. And you make sure the blood is on the lintel and the doorpost of your house. And when the death angel comes, and it will surely come throughout all the land of Egypt. Every first small male in every household, man and beast, is going to die. From the Pharaoh's palace, to the beggar on the street, to the dog on the street, to the prisoner, to the animals, every male firstborn will die. But when I see the blood, watch this now, this is very interesting. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I'll pass over the humans, and I'll pass over your animals. Why? Because they've already sacrificed the firstborn male in his first year. Because that is the price for their freedom. Are you seeing this? The firstborn male of either the sheep or the goats was already sacrificed. So now the cows get saved, and every other animal that they have will get saved. The donkey, the camel, whatever. Humans and animals will be saved, but because of the obedience of the children of God, that's what's going to happen here. 
So obedience has repercussions. Disobedience has repercussions. Sin has repercussions. What you sow, you will reap. You sow righteousness, you will reap a re reward. The glory of God. You sow disobedience, you're going to reap destruction. Hear these words. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools, they that don't believe God in their hearts, shall be destroyed. And I'll tell you right now, the word of God has no respect for anybody. Whether you're of the Judean breed, whether you're of the race of Gentiles, it doesn't matter. Obedience is what puts you in an everlasting glory rank. And disobedience, whether you're a Judean or you're a Gentile, you will have destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Now fast forward it now to the time of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. We see in Matthew chapter 27 certain things that take place. They've condemned Jesus to death, the chief priests and the elders. And only two people amongst the elders did not consent to this. They were Jesus' secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They put up a front, they put up a fight in that Sanhedrin council, but they were overturned by the 68-man council that was there because 70 plus the high priest. And the high priest spoke for them all. He deserves to die. They were, he was taken to Pilate. Now we're going to get into this because we're going from the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, Yahushua Mashiach. Now, when we look, we see here, uh, I'm going to read some verses here, follow along with me, I'm going to go pretty quick, alright? When the morning was come, this is, this is Wednesday, this is the middle of the week, Wednesday morning, so all throughout the night, Jesus had a trial. He had about six trials that day, six. I don't have time to get into all six of them right now, but he was tried in private, then he was tried in, in sorry, in Annas' house, or is it Caiaphas' house, the high priest's house. Then he was taken before the whole council, and they tried him there. And then they abused him somewhat, slapped him upside the head, and started his affliction, because all protection from him now was gone, because it was the hour of darkness. And he said, take me. And so the Lord allowed this to happen, or else it could not have happened. This is the price for our freedom from sin. This is the price for the human race to be saved. Animals can't be saved. Humans. Because that lamb that was slain in Exodus, that lamb was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And that was God manifested in flesh. So the Lord, as it says in St. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. This is how it went. This is the price. This is why no sin is going unpunished, because Jesus paid the price for our sins. So unless you give your sins to Yahushua, Mashiach, Jesus Christ, and exchange it for life in Christ Jesus to culminate in everlasting life in ecstasy forevermore if you don't go through that process and take up your cross in this life and follow him there is no protection for you because when God told Moses to give this instruction to the children of Israel anyone that was disobedient to that they would have found a firstborn male dead in their household and Egyptians that did this, because there were Egyptians that adhered to what Moses said, and they actually grouped in with the Hebrews, they got spared because they obeyed the word of the Lord that came to the God of the Hebrews. Even Yahuwah, the Lord, I am that I am. And so, God is saying today, never mind COVID-19, never mind 5G, never mind whatever background, creed, religious denomination you might be, you better trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because something is coming on the land and it's no respecter of persons. You're going to have to make a choice. And the time of our redemption is drawing nigh. The Lord wants us to know these, uh, these things because history repeats itself. Different names, different places, different faces, 
same concept. History will repeat itself. So we are seeing the beginnings of sorrow. And us who believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, we're to look up because our redemption is at hand. And I truly believe personally that the only reason why the rapture has not yet occurred is because it is because all of the people that God intends to save is not gathered yet. This is kind of like a last call. I don't know how many years this is going to go for, but I'm telling you now, time is wrapping up. And those who do not give themselves to the Lord, repenting of their sins, turning to the Lord Yeshua, Jesus Christ, baptizing in His, in his name, receiving his, the gift of His Spirit, living a life to please Him, you don't do that, you're going to be left behind to face the wrath of those that do not love the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that do not love righteousness, don't even want the Bible around, don't want to hear anything about righteousness and holiness. They are satanic people. They are Luciferian worshippers. These people you're going to have to contend with in a way that the world has never seen. And this is what the Bible says. So let's now get into what the Bible said about our Lord who paid the price for our freedom, freedom from sin, shame, reproach, and iniquity, freedom of uh, delivering us from the depraved human nature that we have to contend with 24-7, delivering us from the consequences of sin. Because like gravity, what goes up must come down. Like gravity, there's a law of reciprocity. What you put out, you're going to get in more than what you put out. In other words, you will reap what you sow. All right. So, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they laid him away, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor, the Roman governor of the province of Judea. Then, let's just jot down, this is uh, Matthew chapter 27, I just read from verse 1 and verse 2. Now we're going to go to verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. In other words, you said it. You said it. Verse 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee and he answered him to never a word you know why because Jesus was not there to defend himself he was there to give a record of the truth he wanted to go on record that he is the truth that he's speaking the truth he's not there to defend himself or to try to deflect judgment this is how he did it he answered not a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly. Verse 15. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the, the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had there a notable prisoner called Barnabas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Yeshua, which is called Mashiach? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. You see, Roman, this Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he was a wise man. He could discern human nature. And he knew that Yeshua, Jesus, was brought to him under condemnation of the chief priests because of jealousy, envy. That's what it always boils down to. For every good work, a man is envied of his neighbor. So don't be surprised if you're walking right and somebody's envious at you and thus become very hateful and undermining and scornful. Why? Because it's envy, it's jealousy. That's what it's always all about. All right. Because he was popular amongst the people. The people were following him and they didn't like the fact that they were losing popularity because all they could use was authority and their, their human authority. But Jesus had spiritual power. He was healing the sick, raising the dead, causing blind people to see, the lame to walk, the dumb to speak. He was feeding thousands upon thousands of people with 
uh, five loaves and two fishes. He did that twice, by the way. All right, five loaves and two fishes and seven loaves and two fishes. Two occasions. So he was doing all these things. He didn't need money to survive. He was taken care of. And so these people, they hated him because they were jealous. How are they going to fight against miracles? Seriously. How are they going to do that? Well, they're going to give a false accusation and pull the trump card of we're in authority and he's not. Human authority is what they use. And this is nothing new. That's what's going to be happening right now. People's souls are being saved and there's going to be human authority fighting against the process of salvation. Nothing new. So don't get rational with this thing. You've got to get spiritual with this thing. And you have to co consider the consequences of the choice you will make pertaining to your eternal existence. Because after you leave this life, you're going to live somewhere. Only the flesh dissipates into dust. That which is the real you, your energy, your soul, your individuality has to either go into heaven or hell. You're going to have to choose which one you're going, to, you're going to end up in. And how do you choose? When you hear the word of the Lord, do not harden your heart. If you harden your heart, you're going to end up in hell. You turn to the Lord, you'll end up to he in heaven. This is the word of God. This is the promise. This is why we're preaching the gospel today. That's the whole point of what they call Easter Sunday. It's not even Easter. It's really Resurrection Sunday. That's the point. He rose from the dead. He conquered death. So everything in this life has been conquered by Yahshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. So if you align yourself with him, you are with you are in the winning team by default. You've already won through Jesus Christ. You cannot win by yourself. Your attempts to be righteous will fail. Because this world will squash out and, and contaminate your efforts to be right, righteous. The only righteousness that is suitable to take you from this life into life everlasting, in pleasure forevermore with the Lord, is the righteousness that was never tainted. And that can only be found in Jesus Christ. That's why they were jealous of him. And Pilate knew this. Now, let's continue with what happened here. Verse 13, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day to, in a dream because of him. Suffered many things, so therefore leave him alone. Don't mess with this man. He's a holy man. We may not understand because we're Romans, but he is a holy man. And I suffered many things in a dream because of this man. Don't condemn this man to death. She sent Pilate the message. So, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Yeshua, which is called Mashiach. They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. Verse 23. And the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, watch this, this is verse 20, 25, all the Judean people, they said, all of them at one word, his blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, 
And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And we know the story. He was beaten to a pulp, raked, his back was raked with leather straps and, and bones and nails on the other. I mean, he was, he was a mess, bloodied all over, beaten in such a way that he could not be recognizable. In fact, the only thing that didn't happen to him was that, miraculously, not a bone in his body was broken. All 206 bones in his body was intact. So the foundation was not affected. All right now. Verse 33, let's just go down to that. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, actually let me just go back a bit, because I, I did I wanted to come up with a certain point. So let's go back to verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the, the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, mocking him, of course. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. They plaited a crown of thorns, put it on his head, ripping off skin off of his brow okay and a reed in his right hand instead of a scepter and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying hail king of the jews this is rome rome is doing this i told you history repeats itself rome represents the dread the gentile world do you understand this rome represents the gentile world you want to see more of this? You look in the book of Revelation. History repeats itself. Rome did this. Let me tell you. The European collective are the nations that stem from the Roman Empire. The Western world. But it's in the Roman Western world where the gospel flourished. So that's why we have much of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ affecting the world right now because in the Roman Western world from that time till now the gospel is being preached. So we who are doing the preaching, we're the salt of the earth. We who are living the life as, as believers in Yeshua, Jesus Christ, we add flavor to the meat called the human race. When we are hindered the meat is not having any flavor before God so God will deal with the rest of the human race in such a way that how they treat us is how God is going to treat them God does not stop persecution but he repays it he says vengeance is mine I will repay no one gets away with anything so the Roman world is not going to get away with what they did to Jesus Christ. Now the first judgment came upon the Judean people. That's why when our, people, our ancestors literally said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. That literally happened via the slave trade. That's what happened for the last 400 years. This is why we have scattered our people all over the world. And we came in with ships. Did you know that in, I believe it's Ezekiel, chapter 8 or chapter 6 one of those, those two chapters did you know that the scriptures say that the children of Judah are going to come back to the promised land from all around the world in ships did you know that we went into slavery in ships we're coming back to the Israel in ships and it's those that were enslaved not just those who were in exile and I'll tell you why because when Jesus and Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt in order to escape Herod's edict that the first or that the males that were two years old and under in Bethlehem were to be killed. Joseph, Joseph was warned in a dream, take the child and your wife into Egypt, Africa, greater Africa, stay there until Herod is dead, then you can come back. 
because he'd be safe down there. They're all black people down there, right? So he can blend in. All right, so they went to Egypt, stayed down there for a few years, came back when Herod was dead, and lived in Nazareth. That's how Jesus became Jesus of Nazareth. He wasn't of Nazareth before, he was of Bethlehem. But his identity was undercover because of those that were looking to kill him. So when he was vulnerable as a man, he was to be undercover, wilderness, so to speak. But when he could step out and show who he really was, that's when the power of grace was upon him to do his public ministry. History repeats itself. But here's the point here. The point is that Rome, the Roman world, was the ones that was giving the oppression at the time. Well, the Rome is still intact right now in the Western world. But you have to remember, and I'm going to say this before we get further into the word, the first Gentile to be saved was a Roman soldier, Cornelius by name. He had Peter come to his house, preach the gospel to rich and poor, male and female, family and friends, Roman soldiers, slaves. Everything was in the house at Caesarea that was owned by Cornelius the centurion. All the elements of Rome was in that house. And guess what? They were all baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other languages. And Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which has received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Just like we did on the day of Pentecost, speaking in tongues, the glory of God all over us. Look at them. Listen to that. And they said, Yeah, we're not going to stop this movement. Sure, let's baptize them. And Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. You'll find these words in Acts chapter 10. So all the elements of the Roman world back in these days are in these times right now. And God is allowing this so that people can be saved all over the world. Not just in the Roman West, but all over the world. As far as China and Japan and Korea and, and in Africa. Well, certainly Africa was... Is the, is the main focus of the Word of God. And when I say Africa, I'm talking the continent all the way over to the Middle East, which again, I will reiterate, was North East Africa. All the way, it included as far east as Persia, and um, meaning Iraq and Iran today. Covering all the Middle East, anything that's called the Middle East is North East Africa. So Africa was the main point, but it filtered into the Western world by the preaching of the apostles and so we have that scenario today only that it's gone beyond that it's gone into India the apostle Thomas went to India preaching the gospel 